Have you ever seen a video of a caterpillar metamorphosing into a butterfly? Probably saw it sometime in school or on Animal Planet, yeah? While most of my classmates and friends were ooing and aahing at the magical event, I was always sitting there thinking, does that hurt? Like, that's gotta hurt, right? Answering that question in detail this early would probably demonetize this video, but suffice it to say, yes, it hurts. Also, trigger warnings for visceral descriptions and bugs, I guess. Today we're going to be talking about Zuko from Avatar The Last Airbender and his struggles with change, and something about the transition from a little wormy to a flying demon sounded pretty relevant to that topic. Zuko is the most tumultuous character in the show, and one of the most tumultuous characters ever written. Anakin Skywalker has a more stable moral compass than he does. Yet Avatar is one of my favorite shows, and Zuko is easily my favorite character, a fact that should surprise precisely no one. Not just because I have a love for all things emo cringe, but also because he's probably most people's favorite character for good reason. Despite his severe insecurities and general foolishness in the early arcs, he has a very kind heart underneath his cold exterior. And he's got a surprising amount of agency for someone who spends over half the show strictly following his father's ultimatum. Tumultuous doesn't have to mean inconsistent, and Zuko is a prime example of a consistent character with flaws and development that make his moral standing excitingly questionable. Of course, it would take eons to run through every instance of this transition, so I'm going to focus on the most interesting of them, the last four episodes of Book 2, from Lake Laogai to the Crossroads of Destiny, and in particular, the illness that comes between. So let's talk about it. I'm Jordan Szymanski, the guy who's just barely emo enough to start shaving his legs. Welcome to my discussion about Zuko's illness as a metaphor for change. So I was under the assumption that everyone under the sun had seen this show, but recently I've managed to find some people who break the mold. So if you've somehow managed to avoid watching Avatar until now, hit that plus button on the next tab, go to your Netflix, and watch the show. Everybody else, it's probably been a minute, so let's synopsize. Zuko spent most of Book 2 running from the Fire Nation after being declared an outlaw by his father. Azula, in particular, has been overzealous in trying to catch him, so Iroh and Zuko decide to hide in Ba Sing Se under new identities. By our starting point, they've been doing so for a while, and Zuko's lamenting his lack of progress in capturing the Avatar, until he catches one of the flyers angst dropping around the city in search of Appa. From there, Zuko tracks Appa down and plans to capture the bison for himself, until Iroh finds him and starts reasoning with him, saying the stuff we, the audience, have been yelling at the TV for months now. First I have to get it out of here. And then what?! Catching the Avatar won't get you what you want, Zuko. Even if it could, this isn't enough to do it, Zuko. You can't keep running from yourself, Zuko. Look inside yourself, Zuko. It's a lot to expect from a teenager, but so is capturing the Avatar, which has not exactly gone well for our resident edgelord. In this moment, Zuko has to make a choice. Maintain the difficult life he knows, or learn the comfortable life he has yet to accept. And to really dive deep into what that means, we need to talk about Jet. In the A-plot of this episode, Team Avatar's flyers are found by Jet, leader of the Freedom Fighters, the Avatar Universe's official MCR fan club. Jet's not a terrorist anymore, he swears, and just wants to help the team find Abba, but instead they find Jet's old team. Stories get confused, Sokka and Toph figure out Jet's been brainwashed, and then a few interesting things happen as they try to piece together Jet's real memories to find the Dai Li secret base. So first Sokka shoves a reed in Jet's mouth, which does nothing. Then they try to get Jet to think about the Fire Nation and what they did to his family. This is where the cool shit is, because Jet's hatred for the Fire Nation is as core to his character as Zuko's desperate need for his father's approval is to him. It's the reason he started the Freedom Fighters, the reason he's as skilled as he is and has gotten this far, the reason he's so violent and quick to anger. Which means the show is telling us something when that doesn't work. He can't break free of Long Fang's conditioning using anger, it's too painful. Katara's healing powers have to push back the pain to make it possible, which implies that it isn't Jet's anger that's getting his memory back, it's Katara, his old flame with a grand capacity for generosity and kindness, things Jet has struggled with in the past. During the raid on Lake Laogai following this excursion, we see Jet fall under Long Fang's control once again and fight against Aang. His movements in this state are unnatural, furious, and wrathful. They're nothing like the trickster-style leg sweeps Jet used against soldiers. It's got all of his anger and none of his intelligence or personality. This is why Jet can't break free of the mind control through anger. 
Anger is what's keeping him bound. Anger is a prime emotion. It's simple and easy to manipulate, but has a powerful effect on the mind. It's more suited to outside control than it is to inner freedom. To break free of that prison, you have to remember that anger is not all of who you are. You have happy memories, loved ones, passions, and skills you've developed over your entire lifetime. These are complex thoughts and emotions, but they all lean towards joy, which doesn't exactly lend itself well to violence. When Aang reminds Jet that he's a freedom fighter, all of these happy memories flood back into him and he regains control of his own mind, bravely turning on Long Feng and lashing out at him. Bravely and foolishly. This is Jet's demise. He survived against trained soldiers and firebenders by using his wits and trickery, not brute force. Trying the latter on Long Feng was bound to end in tragedy. If he had worked with Aang, pretended to still be under Long Feng's control, and waited for an opportunity to strike, they could have won. Jet could have lived. But that wouldn't be a very Jet thing to do. Yes, the trickery and deceit and comedy and smooth talking and intelligence and leadership are all parts of Jet, but so is the anger. So it's lashing out and acting impulsively. For all his smarts, he's incredibly reckless and rarely thinks through the consequences of his actions. I actually don't think I remember him doing that once in the entire show. And that sounds an awful lot like Zuko, doesn't it? At this point in the show, Zuko has... Gotten his ship stuck in an iceberg, burned down the Kyoshi village, sailed directly into a massive storm, freed a prisoner from his own country, willingly walked into a blizzard in the middle of enemy territory, and shown no suspicion or hesitation towards a sister he already knows is not to be trusted. All in the interest of capturing the Avatar so he can go home, and I'm sure I missed something. Reckless, impulsive action is as much a part of Zuko's character as being the enemy of the Avatar. And while we're comparing Zuko to Jet, can I say they're also very similar in their motivations, as both of them stem from home. Jet's home was taken by the Fire Nation, his family slaughtered, and his house burned down. Now he seeks revenge against the entire country, including civilians who had nothing to do with it. Similarly, Zuko's home was taken from him by the leader of the Fire Nation, and the only way he can get it back is by capturing the Avatar, which he has attempted to do by plowing through any obstacle in his way regardless of involvement. Their motivations and methods are so similar that both their friends and families desperately try to talk them out of it. They are equally unhealthy and self-destructive and lead to some serious close calls or even straight-up death. Which brings us back to Appa. As Zuko's staring this bison down, he's thinking about how much his own sister has chased him down. He's a fugitive from his own country, a lost child without a home or parents, and he's beginning to wonder if he'll ever get those things back. Jet's known for a long time that he's never going to be home again. He only really tries to make a new one when he's been brainwashed. Several parts of him died in the fire that took his family, and what's left is a vengeful ghost bent on destroying the Fire Nation the same way they destroyed him. Loved ones first. Foolish boy. You've chosen your own demise. It was never really a choice. Not for Jet. His only motivation of fight is venting his frustration and anger upon the world. There is no version of him that would have chosen differently. But there is a version of Zuko that would. Zuko still has a path ahead of him, a life he can choose to lead. He is not a prisoner of his past, or at least, he doesn't have to be. Because there's another key difference between Jet and Zuko. Jet didn't have Iroh. Jet's had to be the role model to the Freedom Fighters without having a role model of his own. All the stress of leadership without any direction on how to do it right. All the pent-up aggression without any tranquility to temper it. All the reckless impulsiveness without a shred of reasonable forethought. It's no wonder he wound up the way he did. Iroh has been Zuko's guiding hand. He taught him about leadership and inner peace and thoughtful reasoning. He's basically been Zuko's therapist, challenging him on the assumptions he's held all his life. In this moment of questioning himself and the path he's trodden up till now, Zuko does something he'd never have even considered before. He lets Appa go. The one piece of leverage he had against the Avatar, a tool with which to hopefully finally be able to return to the home he knew, he just lets go. And he's better for it. Though, admittedly, that part takes a while to set in. 
After he gets back to his new apartment, Zuko falls deeply ill. He's running a high fever, and Iroh tells him that this sickness is not normal. Zuko just made a decision that contradicts the person he believed himself to be, the son he thought his father wanted. His decision was so drastic that it's having an effect on his body as well as his mind. This fever is essentially his chrysalis, and when he comes out of it, he will be the beautiful prince you are always meant to be. So this metaphor is genius for a lot of reasons, but I can already hear the comments from literary nerds like myself arguing that it's not a metaphor at all. The show directly tells us what's going on. There's nothing meta about this for. This isn't meta text, it's just text. And I would agree with you, but I have looked into this, and to my knowledge, no one else has done this before. I have not seen, read, or even heard of a story that uses sickness as a metaphor for change, and some of the best metaphors we've developed as a society started out as being outwardly explained by the story they're in. Which makes sense if you think about it, metaphors are just literary tools to get a point across in a subtler manner than exposition or lecture. But if it's too subtle, the audience is left floundering for meaning, assuming sexual or deific significance where there is none, because those are some of the most common symbols in literature. But whether they're the most common because writers use them a lot, or because the audience is able to force them into the text more easily, is the subject of much scholarly debate. Death of the author does go both ways, after all. If an audience applies their own meaning to the text, they are then responsible for that meaning. So it's reasonable to avoid this pitfall by just telling the audience what the show is about. Then you can lace the following scenes with all the symbolism you want, and the audience, now aligned to the perspective of the intended message, will still interpolate their own meaning within that message. There's all kinds of stuff you can read from Zuko's fever dreams, and I'll be doing exactly that later. But the fascinating thing about this metaphor is that after seeing it used once, I'm shocked it isn't used more often. Hi everybody, synchronicity is real. I just saw Red from Overly Sarcastic did a trope talk about character development coma tropes, which is really good, and I recommend you watch it, because uh, her having done that, and me being able to direct you to that, means that I don't have to talk about the usage of this trope uh, in a literary context. I can just move on to the cool stuff that I really, really want to talk about about this specific use of it, because there's still a lot of unique stuff regarding Zuko's fever that a lot of other shows, like, I don't think any shows have really properly replicated yet. So I'm gonna keep a bunch of me talking about that stuff in this video, uh, but bear in mind that that was recorded months ago when I honestly just didn't know and forgot that there are a lot of other instances of similar stuff happening. Um, so take my angry tone with a grain of salt, uh, but I don't know, stick around if you want to, and definitely watch Trope Talk, it's really good. Lasting personal change can be one of the hardest things to go through. Few things are as fundamentally new and potentially uncomfortable as questioning your assumptions about life. Personal change requires that you take an objective look at the things you have believed to be true your entire life. Things your parents or teachers or siblings or friends or even romantic partners have told you is 100% true can be wrong. Which is difficult to rationalize when you're as ashamed of yourself as Zuko is. He's been constantly downtrodden by his own father and sister, pushed into believing that he is a lesser breed than them. That they are always right, and if he disagrees with them, that means he's unworthy. This is stuff he's been told since he was able to understand language. Breaking through that is going to take a lot of work, and it's not going to be comfortable. When we get sick, the majority of what causes our pain and discomfort is our body fighting against the illness. That's not universal, but it's true for most minor illnesses, and definitely for fevers. A fever is your body trying to burn the illness out of you, a risky endeavor that can be more dangerous than the illness itself. Which means it's perfect for Zuko's character. A reckless maneuver pulled against impossible odds that could easily result in death? Sign this scarred, damaged youth up. He's got enough of a personal death wish to form a symphonic metal band out of it. This could even be explained in-universe as something that happens to firebenders exclusively. Their manipulation of heat running wild as a result of their brain chemistry going way out of whack. Maybe that's how Combustion Man works. I mean, probably not, but he seems crazy enough for that to be plausible, right? We've been using rain interchangeably as a negative symbol for tragedy and positive symbol for change for years now. Why has the advancement of medical knowledge not led to the same deal for sickness? Specific illnesses are brought up as symbols for specific things. Heart failure is equated to heartbreak. Tuberculosis is equated to wasting away and being forgotten. But these are purely tragic affairs or karmic punishments. People only seem to get sick in a story when they're going to die from it. Why is that? Well, it's because to most of us, that feels real. 
If you look at the leading causes of death, most of them are some form of illness, and they're usually very nasty ones. In health classes, we're drilled about the dangers of AIDS and other STIs. We constantly see cancer in media, both fictional and social. And we all were recently forced into our homes by a global pandemic. Illnesses are serious business, and we are predisposed to fear them. So I think most writers just don't like using them, except for tragic or karmic circumstances. A bad enough illness can feel like the world itself actively wants you dead. It leaves characters forced to decide between fighting against an overwhelming force to survive, or accepting the inevitable and living the best way they can with the time they have left. An illness can feel as targeted and directed as murder sometimes. But it doesn't have to be that way. We've all caught colds or stomach flus or nondescript fevers before. None of us died from that, even though those things can kill. And when we came out of it, our immune systems were stronger than they were before. Sickness is a necessary and ironically healthy process that everyone experiences once in a while. But despite all of that, we're still afraid. We reject illness as a symbol of good on principle just because we don't like it. Instead, the usual symbol of difficult change that turns out to be good is rain. Which also makes sense, I'm not dissing that symbol, but I don't get why it's the only one that can be used interchangeably for tragedy and change. I get the dramatism of it, a rainy day when you're sad can feel like the world is crying with you. Rain keeps us indoors most of the day, but it also makes the ground fertile and waters plants that are necessary for life. But let's not forget that rain brings its own problems too. One of the easiest ways to get sick is by staying outside in the rain. Some pests only rear their heads on a rainy day, and there's also the teensy problem that most natural disasters are paired with rain. But even those at least feel like a cooler way to die than getting tuberculosis, so I don't know what I'm arguing about! I guess it's just kinda upsetting that we use the same torrential rainstorm with the same bright-ass rainbow to follow every time we want to say there's always something good coming out of a difficult change, when we have a far more personal and harrowing symbol for the same thing right here. I get why Avatar was the first show to use this, but why have more shows since then not used this? I would love to be proven wrong, please prove me wrong, because this is criminal. These scenes aren't the best for illustrating Zuko's change because they're written exceptionally well, although they are that. They're the best because they're doing something practical that we can learn from, and apparently we just chose not to. If this doesn't change over the next few decades, I'm gonna die mad about it. Now that I've talked your ear off about how cool this symbol is, let's actually start breaking it down. In particular, let's talk about the fever dreams, because those are loaded with useful info. We begin in the chamber of the Fire Lord with a slew of Fire Nation soldiers standing before Zuko as the Fire Lord. Already I'm picking this apart. Even after becoming a fugitive, Zuko still has immense respect for the Fire Nation troops. His initial banishment was indirectly caused by him defending them in the council room. These are his people, and they fight for his country. He takes pride in that, in being their prince. Which is another thing, Zuko was heir to the throne before being banished. His right to rule may currently be in question, but he spent his whole life absorbing the reality that this empire will be his someday. Which makes it hard to tell if this is a delusion of grandeur or not. Yes, he's putting himself in the position of greater political power than he currently possesses, but it's also a position he believes he has a right to, and he's got genuine reasons to support that belief. If this is a delusion, it's one his family fed into him, and is born of his desire to please them. But Iroh told Zuko that this metamorphosis will make him the beautiful prince he's meant to be, and Iroh is the arbiter of truest wisdom by the show's standards. So I'm gonna turn this one on its head and say it isn't a delusion, it's a nightmare. Even before the blue dragon shows up, Zuko's pride is equal parts faith and prison. Knowing that he's going to be the Fire Lord is a heavy burden. He will have to lead his people someday, and right now he feels more lost than ever. But this is his destiny. This is what he was promised, what he was born to do. He can't abandon that. I think that's why the blue dragon even shows up. It shares Azula's voice and tempts him to sleep, to which Azuko says, I'm not tired. In dreams, our minds tell and show us things we either want or expect to hear and see. It's sort of like a more visual thought process if I'm reading this quote right. In real life, some dreams just don't have meaning, but as this is a story, we can pull from the very existence of the blue dragon that some part of Zuko really wants to sleep right now. This could easily be a symbol for depression. He's got this big dream that he feels destined to reach, but the work to make it happen just doesn't feel worth it. In the worst case, this could be taken as suicidal thoughts, which unfortunately is supported by other events in this dream. But while those might be true, I think it's a little more simple than that. The Zuko in this dream is his conscious thought, and the dragons represent his subconscious. 
My reasoning for this theory is mostly that Zuko spent recent years of his life following what other people want him to say, think, and do. The kind person he was wasn't enough for his father, so he became cold, distant, ruthless, heartless. Or rather, he tried to become those things, to be more like his sister. That's why the blue dragon is wrapped around him, Azula's personality is eclipsing his own. But trying to be someone you're not is exhausting in a way you don't want to admit. Zuko says he's not tired because he doesn't want to be. But the act of being royalty involves keeping up appearances, making your people feel that you are worthy of their devotion. Which is another exhausting endeavor on top of trying to please a father who doesn't love you. But giving that up is also terrifying, hence the blue dragon's sinister quality and possession of Azula's voice. Azula wants Zuko to give up, because that means she'll get the throne. She'll get her father's love and attention, and she'll be able to keep it. What very little competition she has in Zuko will be gone. This isn't necessarily how Azula actually feels, but it's definitely how Zuko sees her. The impression she's given him is that they would both be happy if he wasn't around. Then the red dragon speaks up using Iroh's voice, but it only says one thing. You should get out of here right now. Go! Before it's too late! Iroh, as always, provides the wisest solution to the problem. Even the impression he's left in Zuko's mind is telling him to just go. Rather than force himself into a role nobody, not even he, wants him in right now, and rather than just give up on finding a new place entirely, he should leave all of this behind him. Leave the toxic family dynamics and responsibility to a people dutifully chasing him down behind, and find a new life. But the rational solution is not the one that Zuko's used to picking. The Blue Dragon wins out as the Fire Nation soldiers crumble before their lord. Zuko's image of the military falls apart before his impression of Azula. Pitch darkness surrounds him as we see the world through our would-be Fire Lord's eyes and the Blue Dragon readies for the kill. Sleep just like mother. This is the part that validates this dream as being a symbol for suicidal thoughts. The implication here is clear. Zuko is afraid that his mother is dead, and some part of him thinks he deserves to follow her to the grave. In his mind, it would be the best thing for almost everyone. Ozai wouldn't have to send anyone after him, Azula wouldn't have to worry about competition for their father's love, and he would be effectively punished for not being able to save his own mother. That last one, the desire for punishment, is shown when Zuko's mother comes into view as she cries for help. She turns around and we sink into her eye where we once again see Zuko in the third person as the darkness of his own mind swallows him up. If that's not self-loathing rooted in the loss of his mother, then I don't know what is. With all of this in mind, Zuko's first fever dream is a deep dive into all of his emotional hang-ups around his country, his family, and his stated purpose. The decision to release Appa has thrown all of those things into question, so his mind is reviewing them and handily giving us a look at his own life through his eyes. The conclusion the dream draws is also made clear. These hang-ups will devour him if he does not do something to escape them. So that's what he does. He changes. When Zuko wakes up, the first interaction we see is a meal with his uncle. And you know me, I'm always up for a deep dive about food, especially one that's a little less stressful than- <laughs> Yeah, that. Gotta love a good father-son dynamic. Zuko walks into the room and asks Iroh what the smell is. Iroh calls it juke and says Zuko wouldn't like it. This is an assumption based on the Zuko he's gotten to know. Iroh has tried so many times in the past to give Zuko advice, steer him in the right direction, and 9 times out of 10, Zuko outright rejects his teachings. He learns very quickly that he was wrong to do this most of the time, but the immediate rejection is not lost on Iroh. Look at the way he stormed out when Iroh got his own tea shop. This Zuko does not want to spend time with his uncle, which is why why it's such a welcome surprise when Zuko leans over the pot, takes a whiff, and says, Actually, it smells delicious. I'd love a bowl, uncle. In spite of that horrific dream, or maybe because of it, Zuko latches on to the one loved one that didn't leave him. He's finally ready to appreciate Iroh without hesitation, to appreciate the new life they've built for themselves in Ba Sing Se. A new chance to be happy, to find love and keep it, to live the life he never could have lived in the Fire Nation things really are looking up. It's also worth noting Zuko's enthusiasm for Iroh's new tea shop. Now let's make these people some tea. Because it shows that he has faith in his uncle's skills and his dream. That and what they're doing is facilitating deeper connections with others. Remember, drinks are a kind of meal too. There will be many people coming in for a cup of tea. Couples, families, friends, they'll all have an opportunity to enjoy a lovely brew with the people they care about. Just like Zuko. Unfortunately, running a booming tea shop in the interior of the last city of the Earth Kingdom is a pretty easy way for the Fire Nation refugees to get discovered. 
You can call it the wrong place at the wrong time, but let's be real here, it was only a matter of time before the waves these two were making got seen by somebody. Katara finds Zuko, Azula finds Katara. Azula lures Zuko and Iroh to the palace, and the two of them manage to escape once again. But Zuko doesn't follow through, giving us a little more intel on his change. I'm tired of running. It's time I faced Azula. Zuko understands that he determines the trajectory of his own life. Not Iroh, not Azula. And he intends to assert that control by defying both of them in this moment, which is a crucial mistake. Taking down Azula isn't a bad idea, she's easily their biggest threat, but if they were going to do that, they would need a plan. Certainly they would need at least the two of them together, and even that probably wouldn't be enough. She's not just a skilled firebender, she's an amazing strategist, and she never fights alone unless she has to. But Zuko still has an honor code and expects his sister to abide by it, which is the kind of childish naivete we could expect from our simple plan stand. Azula captures Zuko and brings him to the same cell as Katara, who takes the opportunity to project all of her hatred for the Fire Nation onto him. This is a wonderful scene, and not just for the shipping fodder. Katara starts it off by assuming Zuko's here to capture Aang again. Not an unfair assumption, given his track record, but capturing the Avatar is his only track record. He has only ever gone after Aang and the people who help him. He's even helped Aang on a few occasions, though Katara doesn't know that yet. Point is, she can't pin anything on him besides that. That's all she knows about him. That and that he's the son of the Fire Lord. She applies the sins of the father, calling Zuko an agent of war and suffering. He tells her she doesn't know what she's talking about, which is true, and she tells him about her life. The Fire Nation took my mother away from me. Zuko gives her sympathy and says, That's something we have in common. This is the first time Katara's been forced to really think about who Zuko is. He's always been the representation of the Fire Nation in her head. Hearing that he lost his mother to the same people changes that perspective entirely. It also changes Zuko's perspective a little to know that his homeland robbed someone else of their parentage. Katara explains the way she's been seeing Zuko by making a slightly tactless comment about his face, but it allows Zuko to elucidate his change more clearly to us. He has realized that he's free to determine his own destiny. He doesn't have to do what his father, his sister, or his uncle tell him to do. He can make his own choices. He's always had that freedom, but this is his first time accepting it. Acknowledging that he'll never be free of his scar is recognizing that his past will always be there, but it doesn't have to chain him. Then Katara offers to erase that past. This is a pivotal moment for the show, whether or not Zuko can let go of what happened to him. Or even if he should. Some scars don't fade, and whether or not they ought to is specific to the person wearing them. In Zuko's case, his scar is a constant reminder of the damage his father has done to him. To forget that, to ignore it, pretend it didn't happen, is to invite that damage back into his life. Imagine if Ozai saw that Zuko had gotten his scar healed. What sort of rage would that man fly into, knowing the son he already hates fraternized with a waterbender? Not saying Zuko should make decisions based on his family's feelings, but we kind of have to think of it that way when we're talking about his scar, because that's how Zuko thinks about it. His scar and his father are inherently connected, and to pretend otherwise is damaging in itself. The objective when it comes to personal trauma, particularly that brought on by family members, isn't to forget what they've done to you. That's not a realistic expectation to have. You can't erase the past, no matter how much you may want to. The objective, then, is to move on from it. To reach a point in your life where what someone else did to you when you were young does not define you. To accept that you are more than your abuse and no one gets to decide who you are but you. If Katara were to erase Zuko's scar right now, the show would be telling us many things contrary to general psychology. It knows better than that. Instead, Aang and Iroh show up at just the right moment, interrupting our scene and reminding Zuko of the goal he's had for years. Yes, he just saved Appa. Yes, he just acknowledged that capturing the Avatar is a goal forced on him and not one he has to follow. But he still views himself as the Prince of the Fire Nation and he still views the Avatar as his primary threat. He's still aware that his only hope of ever getting his father's love is capturing Aang. Iroh takes this chance to talk Zuko out of that, tells him to choose good. But then Azula shows up, and despite being the only person in the world on par with Aang in terms of Zuko's threats, she doesn't attack him. Doesn't even speak aggressively to him like Aang did. She treats him with respect for the first time. You're a lot of things, but you're not a traitor. She's got a better chance of beating the Avatar with Zuko than the Dai Li, so she asks for his help. Zuko's little sister is asking him for help. But so is his uncle. 
the goal he's been chasing, or the life that he's earned? Which will Zuko choose? We all know the answer. We've known it since the Blue Dragon. <laughs> During Zuko's illness, he had two fever dreams. The first is the dragon dream we already covered. The second, though, is when he thinks he's woken up from the illness. He gets out of his bedroll, walks to the bathroom, cleans his face, and then he sees this. Ah! This is our clue. Zuko just made a decision his old self never would have, which calls into question who he even is anymore. It puts the fear in his mind that he's becoming like Aang, a rebel against his own people, the demon his father brought him up to fear. Maybe that seems like a stretch, but the whole world knows the Avatar is the only one capable of stopping the Fire Nation. So for anyone brought up believing the war is necessary and actually a good thing, anyone living in the Fire Nation, the Avatar is basically a monster. That propaganda is still lodged deep within Zuko's mind. Remember what Zuko said to Katara? I've realized I'm free to determine my own destiny. He didn't say that he disagreed with the destiny his family had given him, just that he got to choose if it's the one he wants. His pride in his country, his shame in his supposed weakness, his guilt over having done a good thing for his nation's greatest enemy. All of these things coalesce into a moment of concentrated rage and power. I thought you had changed! I have changed. Zuko's right here. The old him would have been more reckless, acted sooner, wanted all the glory of capturing the Avatar for himself. Now he's willing to work with a sister who has done nothing but hurt him if it means he can accomplish the one thing he was sent away from home to do. Being able to choose doesn't mean that a person will make the right choice. But at least this time, it was his choice. I brought up butterflies at the beginning because Zuko's fever really was like entering a chrysalis. Before he does it, he's limited by the path that's been set before him. When he's in it, it's uncomfortable and painful. He has to recognize parts of himself he doesn't like or is afraid of. When he comes out, it's like this weight has been lifted off his shoulders. His movement is more free and he looks a lot happier. There is so much we can learn from this series of events. Zuko was always going to change, it was just a matter of when and how. Whether his change was the result of something outside of his control, like when his father scarred him, or a conscious decision that he made, like saving Appa. Making it the latter shows Zuko that he can direct his own change. Even if change is inevitable, it can still be controlled. Which means it can be good and even comfortable, but only if you're willing to accept it. The more you fight against change, fight to live the way you know, even if it's painful or uncomfortable because you fear the unknown, the worse you're making things for yourself. Zuko had everything he wanted, a normal life with a loving uncle and an opportunity to make others happy. Then it was ripped away from him by another change and he lashed out at that change, making things worse for himself. And when the same person who ripped his new happy life away from him offers him the one he was always looking for. How could he accept the lie in that? To do so would be to acknowledge that the real happiness he was searching for, the love of his own father, was a lie. To accept that everything he was taught as a child was a lie. To recognize that his mother's disappearance being his fault was a lie. These are all feelings too deeply embedded in Zuko to be unpacked within a few short days, no matter how many chrysalises he enters and exits. Breakthroughs are helpful, but only if we give ourselves the time necessary to process and grow from them. If Zuko had been able to run that tea shop with Iroh for a little while longer, maybe he would have changed a lot more and for the better, but he doesn't get that time. The change is still fresh and he hasn't been able to adjust to it. He hasn't let himself adjust to it. That adjustment has to come in book three, and honestly, it's better that it does. It means he has a chance to experience the life he's dreamed of and compare it to the one he had with Iroh a chance to reevaluate his life and his goals. He's always been making the decisions other people gave him to make. His change in book three is his decision. No one else's. And it's one he never could have made without his breakthrough in book two. This is why we need more stories that use sickness as a metaphor for change. Deep, personal change can be harrowing and difficult, but it's always rewarding, always worth the effort. I have never have felt, never more, like felt more like myself than when the definition of the word is in flux. I've changed so much in the past year, and I know that I will change so much more in the future. But every single change 
is one that I can direct. And I know that every one of them will lead me that much closer to the person that I want to be. Just like Zuko. That's more or less the conclusion that I came to when making this video. Um, so that's kind of it. The rest is just credits scrolling by the screen probably over here. And uh, me talking about the channel, basically. I just want to take a moment to thank everybody that... Every returning viewer that has continued to support and <laughs> remained patient with the channel. I know that my uploads could be a lot more frequent if I was a bit more productive, and I will get to that in a minute. Uh, but I just want to thank everybody that's stuck by me and all of the people who continue to watch my videos. It, it really means the world to me. I've been getting a lot of comments on my Starlight Brigade video recently that I just feel so overwhelming support from those comments. And... I'm so happy that that video has gotten the attention that it has. I was really worried um, after I made the Owl House video that that one was going to get buried. But as of the time of this recording, it's my second most viewed video on the channel, and that means the world to me. I poured my heart out for that one, and you guys poured your heart out in the comments, and I felt it. I still feel it. And it just, it means a lot. Thank you. Speaking of thank yous, I want to thank Unlike Pluto for his wonderful uh, music. It's so good. A lot of it is royalty free. You can find a link to his channel and the specific song that I used for this video, uh, Recapture the Magic, down in the description below. Similarly, you will be able to find down there a link to Vernadera, her Twitch, her Twitter, because she made the wonderful thumbnail for this video, and I really can't thank her enough for that. I know I paid her to do it, but still, it's so, it's so amazing. I, I'm so happy with the thumbnail for this video, and that is something that I have not been able to say for most of them. Uh, so, genuinely, Vern, thank you so much. Uh, again, you can catch her Twitch and her Twitter down in the description below. Over the last year, I've been going through a lot of psychiatry, a lot of therapy. I've actually finished a full 12-week course. I may end up going back for more uh, at this point. I'm not planning on it, but who knows what happens in the future. If I feel like I need more, I will go back for it. But right now, I'm just trying some different medications, currently giving different things a shot with my psychiatrist and trying to bring up my productivity. I I'm pretty sure that I've got some degree of ADHD at this point because, man, just actually knuckling down and editing videos together, I just, I can't focus. Like, it's nuts. On a similar note, some expensive expenses have risen for me. Uh, so I've had to take on more hours with my day job. Uh, so that might also impact productivity for the weeks and months coming forward. I'm hoping that this medication will help to counteract that, like, a lot. Uh, but if this isn't the right one, we're just going to have to keep trying, and hopefully I can get to a point mentally where I can really make the these videos in a time that I think you guys are worth because I think that you're worth a lot more than the amount that I'm producing right now. So if you want to offset some of those problems, I've got to plug my Patreon. That's going to be down in the description below as well. Whatever you can give is appreciated. There's a $1 tier for a reason. There is a $5 and a $10 tier, but I honestly wouldn't recommend it, especially if you're struggling right now. Just a single dollar from anybody is going to help me so much, you have no idea. Also, if you want to check me out on Twitch, uh, I'm going to put the link down there as well. That should be pretty much it. Um, again, thank you so much for watching my video and for uh, giving me whatever support you can in whatever way you choose to. Even if it's just giving me another view. Very much appreciate everything that you do. Take it easy, everybody. Hopefully, I'll see you soon. Peace. <laughs> I'm 
checking my list right now, and <laughs> the Google Doc has Vern autocorrected to verb. Oh my god, she's not gonna like that. 